Merci pour l'invitation à parler. Euh, je voudrais donner cette conférence en français, mais je ne veux pas assassiner les belles langues de Jean-Paulion, Robert et Rodin. Euh, donc, je, je vais continuer en anglais. And I apologize also because it will be two foreign languages for most of you. So I'll be speaking in English and the language of DNA and genomes. <laughs> But we'll see where we go. So, um, ancient and historical DNA, very uh, interesting field, lots of interest in, uh, and studies going on, some spectacular successes. Um, Svantik Pabo has revolutionized the field and shown us that we can get Neanderthal genomes, Denisovans, the Ertzi genomes being sequenced, Paleo Eskimos. But there's a problem uh, in that a lot of the work that's gone on in the past, not Svante Pabos, well, even Svante Pabos at the beginning, relied on PCR based amplification, and this brings a, a big risk of contamination. Um, not just the DNA from handlers, people actually who've handled material, but also if you do PCR, you create these amplicons, these PCR molecules, and they can then contaminate all subsequent uh, experiments. And that means there's been some spectacular failures with ancient human DNA. Uh, even Svante Pabo recognizes that in his first, the first papers that came out on the Andertal genome were actually contaminated with modern human sequences. And in fact, last summer I read this book here, The Shadow King by Joe Marchant, who's a British scientific journalist, and she Um, makes the point that actually there's this skeptics versus believers uh, groups when looking at Egyptian mummies. There are some people who say you can get DNA sequences and you can look at family relationships between uh, various Egyptian mummies and they publish in certain journals. And then there are other people, including the speaker earlier, who are entirely skeptical and say actually you can't get any DNA. Nobody's reliably got DNA from Egyptian mummies. And it's worth remembering that Svante Pabo who is now considered like a, a demigod in this field, he uh, tried to get DNA from Egyptian mummies and got a paper in Nature and then had to say, well, sorry, it was a mistake. It was his own DNA. Um, so it's a problem. Luckily, I don't work in the field of looking at human DNA. I work at looking at bacterial DNA and looking at infection. Um, and there's a substantial literature on many different infections uh, reconstructed with, uh, with DNA. Um, and most recently, we've seen the, what we might call the paleogenomics of the Black Death and the tuberculosis, um, here using capture-based approaches to pull genomes out. Now, in this field, there's much less risk of contamination from the handler and from the immediate environment through natural means, because most of us don't have tuberculosis, and we're not going to cough tuberculosis onto our specimen, or, or brucella, or smallpox, or whatever. But there are problems, obviously, still, if you're using PCR, of contamination of carryover. And in fact, there is still this skeptic versus believer schism here. There's a couple of papers um, in the Journal of Archaeological Science where one group here uh, saying that basically most of the work published on ancient tuberculosis, ancient DNA and tuberculosis, is, is, is rubbish. And another group mm -hmm. saying, actually, you just don't understand our methods and, and you're <laughs> rubbish. Um, and... You know, to be honest, if I'd have known that there was this much vitriol in the field, I don't know if I'd have actually come into it. Um, how I actually got to be interested in this um, was these two individuals here. So Dave, David Minikin was working at the University of Birmingham at the same time I was, um, and he said that um, he had some bison bone that was 17,000 years old, and he thought it had tuberculosis in it. And he said, could I get any genome out? Um, and I said, well, if we do PCR, that's, you, know, you have to have a dedicated lab and all those kind of things, uh, and I don't want to do that. And we just had a paper published um, in the Journal of the American Medical Association where we'd shown that you could actually get pathogen genomes from contemporary samples. In this case, there were, some of you may remember in the news headlines, there was a big <coughs> E. coli outbreak in Germany in, in uh, 2011. Um, and we worked with some people at the heart of that outbreak, and they gave us 40 uh, <coughs> fecal samples 
and we managed to pull out the genome of the outbreak strain without any culture from the metagenome. <coughs> so I said, well, I'm happy to try and collaborate with you, but uh, I don't want to do amplification. Um, I, I don't really want to do hybridization capture, um, but, but you do need, I should say, do need to design, not that no, uh, no need to design. Um, oh, sorry, that's why we don't need, if we use shotgun metagenomics, you don't need to design and, and optimize our capture probes. So I was saying, we'll just do shotgun metagenomics. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Sitting in the armchair, you always come up with problems. Well, maybe there'd be too much human DNA, or maybe the amount of bacterial DNA would be a fraction of a percent. Or maybe there were other bacteria that have grown on material <coughs> after death that might give us a problem. The other thing was that I said, well, the 17,000-year-old bison bone is too precious. Can we not work with something that's, that's historical but more modern and where there's more of it? Um, and this is where Helen Donoghue said, um, she's very str uh, well, it's a very, it was a strange introduction to the field. She said that in her basement of her house in suburban London, she had all these remains from mummies from Hungary and that she could give us that 200-year-old mummy remains. I mean, it's just a bit bizarre. You can imagine the police going around there and news headline, you know, woman in suburban London found with you know, hundreds of human remains in her basement. But there we are. She says it's a wine cellar. It's perfectly good for maintaining them at the right temperature. <laughs> anyway, so this is a... a figure I prepared for a, um, a review article I wrote about using metagenomics in a diagnostic sense. But basically, if you want to get information about what bacteria are in a sample, you can try and do microscopy and culture. The, the good thing about that is that you don't know what you're going to find because the culture media that we use are very often very generic and they'll, they'll grow all sorts of things. But it's very difficult to actually uh, work out what you've got and, and in fact, if you're dealing with post-mortem material, the, the pathogens may die very quickly, um, and you won't get them. Okay, so you can then go for amplification and capture, where you know what you're looking for. You have to say, I'm looking for Yersinia pestis, because I think this person had plague, or I'm looking for tuberculosis, because I think this person had TB. And then you amplify or capture that target. So the advantage is it's quite simple and sensitive, particularly with PCR, it's very sensitive. But there's this disadvantage of, of Amplicon carryover. And the other problem is that you have to keep saying, well, what am I looking for? And you have to devise a specific assay for each of the things you're looking for. So the idea of using shotgun metagenomics was that you can just extract the DNA from the sample. You can then create a library and sequence that library, what we call a metagenome, all the different organisms in there, different bacteria, bits of human DNA and whatever. And then it's... Only then, when you're in the computer, using the computer, that you actually go in and pull out the things you're interested in. Um, and so you do the hard work in terms of in the bioinformatics rather than in the laboratory. And the advantage of this is that you can just do it on anything. You don't have to think too hard about what am I looking for. You just go in there and, uh, um, and it's open-ended. The disadvantage is, is that... It, relatively expensive, although the price is coming down for sequencing all the time, and it is technically demanding. Um, so when we tried to, to write this work, some of this work up, uh, we wrote it up for the New England Journal of Medicine, and I put at the end, all oh, this, these results illustrate the, the ease and power of metagenomics. And the editor of the New England Journal, the only change he made was he said, strike out the word ease, because this is not easy. <laughs> it was easy to us, because we, we're experts in this field, but he said, no, it's not easy. But I think it is becoming easier as time goes on. So now down to some more specifics. So the specimens that um, Helen Donoghue had access to came from a, a town of Vats in Hungary, in, in, in Pest count, uh, County, north of Budapest, on the eastern banks of the Danube. And what happened was that in 1994, when they were doing some renovation work on the church, the Dominican church, they discovered a crypt that had been sealed uh, since 1838. And this crypt had been used for the burials of middle-class Catholic families and clerics from 1731 to 1838. Um, and this is the church here. And the 
the bodies in there were actually inside uh, these coffins, wooden coffins, and many of them have become naturally mummified. Um, why that's the case is not entirely clear. The temperature was fairly even, about 10 degrees Celsius. There was, the, the, the crypt was not entirely sealed off atmospherically. There was a little bit of a draft going through it. It may be that also the use of pine and pine chippings in the, the mummies, uh, in the coffins, contributed to the mummification, but it's not entirely clear, I don't think. Here are some examples of some of the, the mummies from this collection. Um, and some of them have been investigated um, by radiology and other methods. Uh, uh, and some of them showed evidence of tuberculosis. And in fact, tuberculosis was very common uh, at this time. If you, if you have a look at the graph showing the prevalence of tuberculosis um, in Europe, in the UK, I would imagine the same is true in France, they're always going down like this. Um, and Basile Camet made a small difference. Antibiotics made a small difference, but basically been coming down. But if you go further enough back, then this was probably the time of peak tuberculosis in Europe. Um, and uh, it's said that one in four individuals, uh, as many as one in four individuals, actually had tuberculosis then. Um, so some work, quite a bit of work, had already been done on this collection of mummies. Um, uh, this guy, Mark Spiegelman, uh, uh, Australian-Israeli, uh, he'd been um, going in with fiber optic methods and getting samples from these mummies, and they'd actually tried to grow the tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, but had, had failed to be able to do so. Uh, they grew it in, in, in rich culture media. They even shoved the samples into guinea pigs, which is considered to be a very sensitive way of culturing tuberculosis, but couldn't grow it, but they could visualize bacterial, bacterial cells that look like mycobacterium tuberculosis. Without growing it and doing any biochemicals, you can't know for certain that they're tuberculosis, but it was consistent with the whole idea that these people had tuberculosis. And a number of other molecular studies were then carried out and showed that you could actually amplify uh, TB DNA from these samples. Um, in fact, you could, in some cases, get even a, some genotyping, so you could work out what kind of lineage of tuberculosis um, was coming out of these patients. Um, and in some cases, it appeared that there was actually a very large amount of mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA uh, in the samples uh, using quantitative PCR. So that's basically where, where the situation was and at uh, the time that Helen Donoghue came to us and said, oh, would you like to look at these? So she gave us um, a sample from this individual, a lady called Terezia Hausmann, um, and she died on Christmas Day in 1797 at the age of 28. Now, she'd been chest x-rayed as well, alongside many of the other mummies. In her case, the chest x-ray was clear, but she did appear to be what we call cachectic, which is basically very wasted, which is consistent with dying from tuberculosis. Um, and molecular and uh, microbiological and molecular analyses on the chest sample had already confirmed that, yes, it, she had tuberculosis. And this is what she thought to have looked like at the time that she was actually put into the coffin. So we extracted uh, some DNA. In fact, a lady called Jackie Chan, who works in my, was working in my group at the time, extracted DNA and made a sequencing library on the Illumina platform, the Illumina MySeq platform. Um, and we did 5.5 million, generated 5.5 million uh, DNA sequence reads using uh, the Illumina version 1, 2 times 150 base pair kit. Those 5.5 million reads, in fact, it turned out that less than 1% of them actually aligned against the human genome. So given this is only 200 years old, it means that it, yet yeah, it's going to be hard to get human DNA out of Egyptian mummies from 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. Um, but that was good for us because we weren't looking for human DNA, we were looking for bacterial DNA. <coughs> 
And what we found was 8% of the sequence reads actually aligned against Mycobacterium tuberculosis H37RB, which is often used as the reference strain, the first genome sequence uh, from this species. And it, I, I was almost knocked off my chair when they said, well, we've got 32-fold coverage of this genome. So that means that every base in the genome, on average, is represented 32 times in the sequences we were getting. And that's not too bad if you were trying to sequence a contemporary M. tuberculosis culture. I mean, we'd normally be looking for somewhere between 20 and 50-fold coverage. So I was absolutely amazed. And I said, well, this is too good to be true. Are we sure this is right? But we scratched our heads, and we, we couldn't think of any other explanation than the fact that it was the genuine article. We'd not cultured Mycobacterium tuberculosis in our lab. We'd never done any Mycobacterium tuberculosis-specific PCRs or even whole genome amplifications. I haven't said it here, but none of us had tuberculosis and were coughing onto the samples. <laughs> so we thought, well, it must be true then. Uh, and uh, uh, we could certainly contamination in our laboratory could be ruled out. <coughs> so, uh, what Martin Sargent did, who was the bioinformatician involved in the project, was he actually mapped the reads against the H37RV genome. So, along the bottom here is the position in the genome, and then this is the, the, at the depth of coverage. So, the, the variance is shown in the, in the, in the light purple. And then the average depth of coverage is shown in red there. And you can see that, by and large, it's even across the whole genome. So that is, again, good evidence that this is real and not just some artifact, some contamination from, say, other mycobacteria in the sample. There's a big spike there. That big spike is the ribosomal RNA genes, which are the most conserved part of any bacterial genome. Um, and they're very highly conserved, and so it's not surprising that we there are other bacteria in the sample that were actually aligning there. Um, and you'll see there's a few places where the coverage drops, and we'll talk about that. In a, well, we'll talk about it now, actually. If you look at the um, areas where there is a dropout, you can see it's quite a clean dropout, as if there has been a deletion in that genome compared to the reference strain that we were looking at. And when Martin looked at the literature on the, the tuberculosis, he found that there, these deletions in the genome were characteristic of a particular lineage, this so-called Harlem lineage, um, and that also gave it uh, some very similitude. We actually could believe the results. So then what he tried to do was to, to see, it, to, to look at the single nucleotide polymorphisms, the single base pair changes in our genome relative to the reference genome, and see if he can actually place the genome on a phylogenetic tree representing all of the TB genomes that were known. And when he tried that, he just kept getting these bad results that didn't make much sense. Uh, so he's got body 68 here next to H37RV, um, when he, he knew that it wasn't actually because we'd shown that it belonged to another lineage by the deletions. And he was scratching his head and he had a bad weekend thinking about this mm -hmm. and thinking, what was he doing wrong? And then suddenly he realised what it was, uh, something wrong. Um, what he realised was that the pipeline he was using to analyse the data, so the uh, previous speaker, Philip, pointed out that when you do these alignments, you, you do alignment lots and lots of sequences, and you only believe the <coughs> result when almost all the sequences agree. Um, so that if, you, if you've got... 20 sequences, and two of them are one thing and 18 are the other. You say, that's nonsense. And what he'd been doing was he'd actually been throwing away any, any SNPs, any single nucleotide polymorphisms, that were not there in 80% of the sequences aligning at a position. And when he realised that, that there was a problem, <coughs> he took away that consideration, and he looked in the genome, and you can see in some parts of the genome, a SNP is clearly represented... Uh, and, and are tested by all the sequences in alignment. But in other parts of the genome, half of the sequences were giving support for the SNP, and half were not. I um, mean, in some cases for here, you've got two SNPs that are very close to each other, I and mean, you've got one um, represented in one uh, sequence and not in the other, uh, and, and, and a, a second SNP in that same sequence. 
So he realized what had happened was he actually had a mixture of two different strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis in this sample. Um, and that was what had been confusing him. And so he managed to tease those apart. So he went and looked at the coverage plots again. And in some parts of the genome where there's a dropout in the coverage, it drops out completely. There's no sequences at all there. But in other places, the coverage drops to 50%, which again suggests that that deletion is present in one of the two strains, but not in the other one. So again, we started to get consistent information from this single nucleotide polymorphisms and the pattern of deletions that, that, that was consistent with the idea that there was a mixture here. But again, I, I was a bit sceptical. I said, is this really credible? Because I wasn't aware that people can get mixed infections with TB. I went and looked at the literature, though. And in fact, there, there was a recent paper from KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa where they said about 10% of people who have tuberculosis in that area, an area of so-called high endemicity, where there's lots and lots of TB, about 10% of them suffer from mixed infections. Um, and so if we assume that Europe at that time was an area of high endemicity where there's lots of tuberculosis, and people were coughing different strains over each other all the time, <laughs> then it's believable. And interestingly, there's actually a family group from the Hausmann family. There's a mother and her two daughters. And uh, a technique known as spologotyping, which is a way of, um, rather old-fashioned way now, of, of classifying uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis strains, had identified two different genotypes in the family, different in the mother and in the daughter. So it kind of made sense. So, uh, and interestingly, the, the most closely related genome sequence strain was um, from Germany, from an outbreak in Germany um, that had been that, that centered on northern Germany. Um, and um, so it's clear that this was a European lineage. So we wrote that up for the New England Journal of Medicine uh, as a letter, which you can go and see. And we drew a little diagram showing the deletions that we thought that we could see along the way. And we talked about mummy genome one and mummy genome two. Um, and we rushed that out. And we thought that we were going to get priority and be the first people to deliberately sequence a metagenome to get bacterial DNA sequences. I forgot to say earlier that ERTSI, when they sequenced ERTSI, the Tyrolean ice mummy, they did actually find um, some sequences from a bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi. They weren't looking for them specifically, but they found them. So we weren't the first to find a, um, a bacterium in a metagenome in ancient or historical material, but we were the first to deliberately go looking for it. Um, but then uh, Johannes Krauser, at the same time as we were publishing this, in fact two weeks or three weeks before we got our paper out, he published in Science showing that he could get a mycobacterium leprae genome from the metagenome of a tooth from, from the Middle Ages. Um, and so it's clear that the, we were both thinking along the same lines and uh, we were scooped in a sense. We did more of this, though. Um, we went back to Body 68, Terezia Hausmann, and took a different piece of lung sample. This time we got much better sequence results, and we ended up with 300-fold coverage of the genome. Now, it was a bit odd that when, in our first analysis, these two strains were there, but they were there 50-50. Uh, it seemed a bit of a coincidence that they're in exactly equal amounts, but they've now gone back and actually one of them is just slightly more abundant than the other and it's allowing them to actually segregate out the two strains according to the depth of coverage of the SNPs and reconstruct the, the ratio. <coughs> the third uh, sequencing run we did was uh, from what was called Body 121, a guy called Benitsky Laszlo, um, who died in a house fire. And here, instead of working on soft tissue, this was DNA extracted from bone, and we got very poor results. We got about 5% of it mapping to human, um, but very difficult to interpret results when we tried to map it against TB. And it appeared to be a mixture of TB and mycobacterium other than tuberculosis, or MOT as it's sometimes called. But there was something else in there. Um, and we then looked at a range more of more of these samples. And what you find here is that if you 
just do your mapping against the reference genome, so you know what TB genome looks like and you, and you layer up your sequences on it, you get these very spiky profiles where some parts of the genome there's lots of sequences aligning and other parts there's hardly any. Um, and we realised that actually this was um, a mistake. Uh, it was, well, an artefact because there were other organisms in the mixture that were related to tuberculosis but weren't tuberculosis, the other mycobacteria, no cardias and so forth. Um, if you then increase the stringency of the mapping <coughs> so that you say I'm only going to allow the sequences to align or to map if there's only three mismatches or, or, or fewer um, I'm not going to allow it to, to match otherwise basically in, in some cases it all goes away so in body 26 basically we, did, we see no evidence that there is any tuberculosis map, uh, mapping the, the sequences mapping to any tuberculosis that peak there is obviously the 16 is the ribosomal genes but otherwise nothing Whereas in body 21, we go from having this spiky profile to going to a much smoother profile, lower depth of coverage, but nonetheless still credible because it's even coverage across the genome. So then we said, let's have a now, let's look now at a much larger range of sequences of, of samples, and we looked at about three dozen sequences uh, on the MySeq to just see what was uh, how many sequences we could find. Um, and again, this problem of uneven mapping cropped up, and we thought that actually we, quite a lot of them had TB, but when we went in and, and we uh, mapped them very stringently, we found that probably about two-thirds had some tuberculosis sequences in them, but it was very, very small amounts, um, yeah, less than 0.01% uh, of the genome was mapping, and in some cases... Uh, the, the, much of the metagenome was taken up with these other mycobacteria, so 20% of the genome nearly in some cases. Um, and it turns out that most of those, those genomes were belonging to the mycobacterium avium complex. So what we think is that that is an organism that just grows on dead bodies um, and probably survives um, desiccation and, and lives in that kind of environment and probably also survives a rather harsh DNA preparation protocols that we, uh, we used. So then we said, well, actually, let's have a look at the best of those and go tenfold deeper in our coverage, or more than tenfold deeper in our coverage, and go to the HiSeq. So for those of you who are not familiar with sequencing, um, the MySeq is a, a small instrument about the size of a, of a laser printer that you could fit on a desk, and it's very easy to use and cheap. It costs about £500 for that. Six, seven hundred euros to do one run. The high seek is the big daddy. <laughs> That's what you sequence human genomes on, um, and that costs five thousand pounds, i.e., about six or seven thousand euros per run. But we said, well, let's go and just blow some money, and we sequenced uh, these samples on the high seek, and we ended up getting coverage, much better coverage, but still not brilliant. Um, not even the full genome's worth in most cases, and in a couple of cases, a little bit more. Now, when you try and actually work out where uh, genome sits in a phylogeny, um, if you're just sequencing individual isolates, you get much you get much better depth of coverage than this, and you can do it properly. Here, we're having to to use suboptimal data, um, but luckily there are some uh, programs out there uh, that will allow you to actually do a placement. If you basically build a, uh, a, a phylogenetic tree out of the sequences you already know and trust, uh, then you can place them. In fact, we also did three more samples um, uh, um, on a separate MySeq run, and on those we, we did achieve high coverage. Anyway, to, to cut a long story short, this is our current thinking. So we've managed to... We, we built a tree of all the TB genomes that were known. We, we borrowed this information from a, a guy called Paul Kime, who works in the USA. And then we threaded our genomes from our different bodies, uh, from our different mummies, onto that. Um, and they basically form uh, three different clusters, if you like. They form into three different groups here. Um, and you can see body 68.2 is one of the genomes from Terexia Hausmann, and it clusters very closely with body 28.1, which is from her mother. So it suggests that there was cross-infection between the mother and daughter, 
or at the very least they both caught their, one of their TB strains from the same person. Um, so that's evidence of cross-infection within a family. The other thing that uh, the bioinformatician has been doing is in addition to looking at the deletions that we mentioned earlier as a way of working out where genomes belong in a phylogeny, you can also look, there are these jumping genes called insertion sequences that you get in bacteria, and they jump into different places around the genome, and then they tend to just sit there and do nothing. And so they can act as markers of lineages. And so uh, Martin's been using that as independent evidence to confirm these placements of these different genomes in these different uh, clades. So, we've been able, using shotgun metagenomics, not just to get evidence that tuberculosis is in these samples, but in many cases to get whole genomes or near whole genomes, uh, and to, to be able to then construct the epidemiology of tuberculosis uh, in Europe at a time um, when the instance was much higher than it is today. And in fact, we, we've also, it's clear that also that there were lots of strains in that one location. So we might think nowadays that there are lots of different strains of tuberculosis around because people are always jumping on aeroplanes and travelling or whatever. But even 200 years ago, there were at least three different clusters of M. tuberculosis in one place in Europe. Um, and we're very confident that these metagenomic approaches actually are, are going to work and be a, represent a new tool in actually documenting the emergence, evolution, and spread of pathogens uh, at, in, on past infections, and also uh, for contemporary infections as well. Um, now, I haven't had time. I could have told you another story. Uh, I was advised that basically you're interested in soft tissues. You're not interested in hard tissues. But we've actually done something very similar where we've got a, 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 an organism called Brucella melatensis, which causes infection in humans. It's normally caught from eating uh, dairy produce or, or in farmers with uh, direct contact with sheep and goats. Um, and we've recovered from um, a medieval sample of a calcified nodule that was found associated with a skeleton. Um, we've recovered this Brucella melatensis genome. And again, we've got it enough depth of coverage that we've been able to actually place it on a phylogenetic tree and show that it's been it's closely related to other Italian Brucella genomes from, from contemporary samples. Um, we're also working uh, with, with, with Raffaella in the future. I put this up here because she's got some Fayum mummies uh, that she, and this is a Fayum mummy portrait and you can see the continuity of facial features in the Mediterranean region over around 2,000 years. So uncanny, a remarkable similarity there between those two individuals. Um, this is Arijon, who is a, 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 a French queen in the Frankish period, Merovingian period, and we have some lung tissue from her that uh, Raphael has sent us, and we're just in the next couple of weeks we're going to analyse that. And we may or may not find something interesting. It's worth saying that we, to get the Brucella, we have to analyze eight samples mm, from various bits of Sardinia and, and elsewhere, and one of them gave us an interesting result. So we'll have to see what happens. Thank you very much. Oh, and I forgot to say, I have my own YouTube channel. I've recorded this talk. So if anyone wants to listen to it again, or anyone who's not here, that you want to show it to, you'll be able to do that. I'll put it up onto YouTube tomorrow.